This Rabbi Yaakov Wolby podcast is sponsored by Fabuloso Household Care Rabbi Cleaner. Pastor, Fill I your home with joy. No ads on my podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Tyson's Face Tats. No Have ads. you ever wanted to look like. No sponsorships. Average Rabbi, please. Bill and Anthony's Daily Multivax. Order your six month supply Rabbi with Pastor, promo code TORCH for 10% average off. Average Rabbi. No ads. No sponsorships. No promo codes. But this is how we make money. This is not how we make money. This is not how we make money. I, I will not subject. My podcast listeners, the listeners that I love, the listeners that want to come hear Torah and hear words of wisdom and learn about their heritage and learn about Jewish history and learn about Jewish values and connect themselves with the Almighty and connect themselves with His Torah and deepen their bond with their soul. I'm not going to have readouts. Rabbi Basto, my dear colleague, I'm not going to do it. Rabbi, well, we have bills to pay. Uh, so what's the other option? Is there anything else we could do? We need help. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we, maybe we do something else. You see, most podcasts, they have to pay their bills and they have ads and they have readouts and they have promo codes and they have Dollar Shave Club and Geico and mattresses. I don't want to sell you mattresses. I want to give you what you come for. I want to give you Torah. I want to give you wisdom from the Almighty. I want to give you a connection with our glorious religion and glorious heritage. But we need to pay our bills. So what we do is that we don't do any ads. No ads. No, no matter how much the average rabbi, my colleague, Rabbi Busto, insists on doing the ads, insists on doing these promo codes, none of that. We do an annual fundraiser, and that's happening right now. And the website for that is givetorch.org. Give, the word give, to give. Give your heart. Give your soul. Give a little boost, a little bit of love to Torch. GiveTorch.org. It's happening right now. Every donation is doubled. This is our only annual fundraiser. We do this once a year. Until next year, you're not going to hear about this. It's happening now. If, you, if you're hearing this right now, you should know that it's still active. Every donation is doubled. And yes, Robert Busco, he's insistent. He's insistent. Are you insistent? Well, if there's a better a little solution. Bit. I do like the multivax. <laughs> yeah, okay. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll, maybe we'll make a little exception for that. But no ads. That, that's the plan. We've done now podcasts since 2012, 12 years, and we're committed to this. We're committed to connecting Jews and Judaism locally in Houston and globally throughout our podcast and the many other digital offerings that we have here at Torch. We do one fundraiser a year and we want your support. Visit givetorch.org. Right now, press pause on the podcast. Press pause. Stop the podcast. GiveTorch.org. Make a donation. And then, you know, for the rest of the year, you are partnering with us. We're not going to bombard you with ads. We're not going to bombard you with fundraising emails every day, every week, every month. Once a year, we try to get everyone to give, everyone to contribute. If you appreciate our work, if you enjoy our work, if you want to support our work, if you want to support the great rabbis here at the Torch Center, Rabbi Busto, the average rabbi, and everyone else that's over here, and all the incredible work that we do here from the Torch Center Houston, Texas, visit givetorch.org right now and make a donation. Show us some love. We're not gonna, we're not gonna drive you crazy. Make the donation. Of course, my email address is rabbiwolbajima.com and that website again, givetorch.org. This Parsha podcast is dedicated in loving memory and Lilo Nishmas Gamliel Ben Baruch, Glenn Cantor, who passed away recently. Glenn was the brother of our dear friend Mark Cantor. Glenn was a very special man, a beloved father and grandfather, a brilliant scientist, and someone who came from a very prestigious rabbinic family. And he passed away under tragic circumstances. A couple of weeks ago, may his soul be elevated in heaven. This week we recorded the fourth episode of the Torch Insider podcast, and uh, we had only given invitations to some beta testers, just, you know, some friends who are listening, just, you know, before we release it to the wider public. Uh, this is, it's an insider podcast, so only Torch insiders can listen to it. And you have to get a special invitation code that we emailed to you. It's your own personal, non-transferable link to subscribe. And uh, we start off with just a small cohort, and we're expanding the audience. So if you're a listener 
who's listened to our podcast, let's say for a while, I don't know, maybe more than a year, and you're okay with a little bit edgier content, then send me an email and I'll send you an exclusive invitation to listen, to subscribe to the Torch Insider podcast. I have been getting some reports that the invitation link is landing in some people's spam folder. So if I send it to you, or if you suspect that I did send it to you, check your spam folder. Cause this is, it's just, it's too good. It's too spicy. It's too spicy for you to miss out on. That's announcement number one. Announcement number two is a very exciting news. Please God, next week we're hosting our annual torch fundraiser. Hooray. Everyone knows that. This is a special week for Torch. Uh, we have one fundraiser a year. That's our philosophy. And we asked everyone to just give what you can give and help support us so we can continue the great work of Torch in 2024. That's the bargain. We don't have ads on the podcast. There's no paywalls. We don't charge for our services for the Torch Center, for classes. Everything's free. And then all we asked is for your annual donation. We do it once a year. It starts next week. We have a website that we uh, host the campaign on. That's givetorch.org, and it's, it's kind of nice because every donation is matched. So every donation is doubled. So your, your giving, your impact is going to be amplified, and that helps keep the Parsha podcast trucking. But not just the Parsha podcast, all the other great work of our organization, Torch. Isn't that exciting? You get to partner with us. And that's going to happen next week at givetorch.org. And please, God, I will reach out to all of you and ask you for your support. The annual Torch fundraiser is almost here. But you know what is here already? This week's Parsha podcast. And that's happening right now from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. My name is Yaakov Wolby. The address is rabbiwolbygmail.com. So let's begin. It's Parsha's Vayakel. This is the fourth of five Parshios that discuss the tabernacle. The Jewish people are told to build a sanctuary for God, to build a mikdash, a mini portable temple for God. And we've read about that Parshish Truma Tetzava, some parts of Kisisa last week, and this week is Vayakel, and next week is Piku Day. Now, most years, the final two Parshios of the Book of Exodus are bunched together, but this year, because it's a leap year, we have two Adars, so Vayakel and Pekude are separate, and these parshas are going to be the, the the fulfillment of the plans that were laid out in Parshas Teruma and Tetzave. And I always think that you know these parshas to talk about the tabernacle. It's a bit of an acquired taste. It's not it's not clear to us, at least initially, why the Torah dedicates so much real estate discussing the tabernacle. And it seems to us that there's a lot of repetition. You know, we have Teruma and Tetzave and Teruma, the Parshish Teruma, Moshe has instructed to go do the fundraiser and then to build the ark and then to build the table and to build the menorah and then to build the actual structure of the Mishkan and the covers, the various different covers that go on top of it. And then we read about the vestments of the high priest in Parshish Tetzave. And we're, we're told all the things that we need to do. And now is the implementation Phase, it's almost the exact same content. But now it's not God telling Moshe, it's now Moshe instructing the people and then, and them doing it. It seems like we could have consolidated a lot. If you just simply said, well, Moshe told the nation everything that God told him. And of course, there's a lot of precedent for that. Many times in the Torah, it doesn't repeat both when God tells Moshe and when Moshe tells the Jewish people. It just says, well, Moshe did what God told him to do. And we imagine, if you read these parshios, that we could have saved a lot of ink. You know, in our community, we have a scribe, a sofa. And I, I have this dream. I want to I write my own Torah scroll. So I'm always badgering him. I say to him, T- teach me, teach me how to write. I want to learn how to write. I want to learn how to write a Torah scroll. And I tell him, you know, it's, it's easy. I want to write Torah scroll. It's only, what, 300, 4,000, 805 letters, 245 columns of writing. I'll, I'll just do every week, I'll write that week's Parsha, and I'll finish the whole, a whole Torah scroll in, in a year. Now, the truth is, it's not easy at all. If you do that, you probably spend like five, six, seven, eight hours a day 
to be able to write a whole parsha in just a week. So couldn't the Torah have made it a bit easier for all these poor scribes? Go easy on them. Consolidate a bit. Let's simplify a bit. Let's do some editing. And they always say that you're supposed to edit. Just remove, remove all unnecessary words. No, take out the word all. Remove unnecessary words. Just remove the words that seem to be unnecessary. And whenever we have the Torah saying something that we would have omitted, it should always get our attention. And it's hard for us to appreciate the salience of these parshios. A friend of mine called them, I thought this was hysterical, their flyover parshios. Now, that terminology might not make sense to our sizable international audience, but in America, so it's kind of a big country, and a lot of people live on the East Coast, and a lot of people live on the West Coast, and then in the middle, it's mostly empty. And the, the people who live on the coasts, they say, well, we got to fly from California, from Los Angeles, from San Francisco, from Seattle, to the East Coast, to Miami, to, I don't know, Charlotte, to D.C., to Boston, to New York. And everything else in between is just flyover country. It doesn't really matter. It's a little bit, you know, elitist to say that. So are these flyover partios? And we have the exciting stories of Genesis, and we have the very compelling beginning of Exodus, and then we have this this whole month, really, of of the tabernacle. And I will remind you, we also have the book of Leviticus upcoming, which is also hard for us to appreciate. But of course, there's nothing in the Torah that's extra. There's no, there's no flyover portion in the Torah. Not, nothing's empty. If we find a portion of the Torah that's empty, it's really empty from us. It's not empty from it. So in this podcast, I want to try to share some of the ideas that are powerfully relevant and valuable and salient for us. You know, we don't have a temple. We've never seen a tabernacle. Yet there are insights and lessons that can completely reshape our lives, that can help us develop ourselves and actualize our potential, that can enrich our lives in meaningful ways. So let's begin. Today we have two segments, a short, very nice one, and then a little bit of a longer retro, a retro segment. The one, one that really would fit better in last year's Parsha podcast cycle than this year's, but that, but that's okay. Parsha begins, Moshe gathers the nation. Everyone's there. And the purpose of this, of this congregation is for Moshe to tell them, okay, it's time to build a tabernacle. We need the gold, we need the silver, we need all these types of wool, the special stones. But the first thing Moshe tells them is about Shabbos. It begins with a quick instruction to not violate the Shabbos. Now, we've seen this before. Shabbos seems to always be connected to the tabernacle. We have to build the tabernacle, but we cannot do it on Shabbos. And all the things that are necessary, all the activities, all the types of work that are necessary to build the mission are all the 39 categories that are prohibited to do on Shabbos. But here's the question. Why must we be told again and again with relation to the tabernacle to not violate the Shabbos? You know, we could be told in many places, there's, there's all sorts of mitzvahs that we cannot do on Shabbos. You know, we talked about writing a Torah scroll, right? Correct, not right. Correct. You have to write a Torah scroll. Correct. That's the final of the 630 mitzvahs to write a Torah scroll. May you do that on Shabbos. Well, writing is one of the third and prohibited items of uh, of work. You don't do that on Shabbos. But we're not told that over there. We're told it with, with relation to the Mishkan. So what's this deeper connection between the tabernacle and, and Shabbos? So this is an idea, and this is an idea that we've shared in the past. We're going to take it in a little bit of a different direction today. Very powerful, very deep idea. There are multiple types of sanctuaries. Of course, we have the tabernacle, 
That's a sanctuary. And that's a portable one that you could assemble and disassemble when you need to travel. And then reconstruct it when you settle down in the new place that you, that you have encamped at. And we have the first temple. And we have the second temple. And then we have, of course, the Mishkan that was made, the, the permanent one that was made in Shiloh and Shiloh. But as they just tell us, that there's yet another type of sanctuary. A sanctuary that's still around today. A sanctuary that actually encompasses what we are trying to do here in our lifetimes. All the way back in chapter 25 of Exodus, at the very beginning of the instructions of the tabernacle, the verse says, Ve'asu li mikdash. God tells Moshe, go tell the Jewish people, they shall make for me a sanctuary. Vishachanti, and I will dwell b'socham, in them. A sanctuary that's singular. In them, it seems out of place, the commentaries point out. The verse, the verse should have said, Vishachanti b'socho, I will dwell in it, in the singular tabernacle. Why does the verse say, Vishachanti b'socham, in them? So the sages tell us, that this is to hint that in addition to the physical sanctuary, the physical tabernacle, every individual must construct within themselves a sanctuary, a tabernacle. Within each person, there ought to be a sanctuary. Every person is supposed to make themselves into a sanctuary, into an abode, a domicile a hospitable residence for the Almighty. And that's what the verse is telling us. In addition, of course, to the Mishkan, it's telling us you should make, the whole nation should make for them, within themselves a sanctuary and God will dwell inside them. The ultimate objective for us, if you could kind of create an image of what we're supposed to turn ourselves into, it's to turn ourselves into a sanctuary, a tabernacle, To carve a space within us, to carve a place in our heart where God will feel comfortable, a hospitable abode for the Almighty. Now, this idea fundamentally transforms our understanding of the Mishkan. It's not only some one-time deal that was done once thousands of years ago. Each one of us, we need To do that, we have to assemble ingredients, materials, qualities, and use them to build a sanctuary, a residence for God within ourselves. Now, what does that entail? What would we need to do to make ourselves a place where God can dwell? Well, the first thing we need to do is to remove from within ourselves, any noxious elements that that are incompatible with God. We have to make sure that we are fully compliant with the will of, of, of God. If God says, I don't want this, and you say, I'm doing it nonetheless, well, that's not a place where God wants to be, so to speak. If we're completely in sync with the will of Hashem, then Hashem says, okay, this person is carving out space for me. We're supposed to live our life like we are in the constant presence of a great king. How do you behave if you are around royalty? Today we don't have so many great examples of what royalty looks like. But it used to be that there weren't, uh, you know, prime ministers and presidents. There were kings. And people would tremble to be in the presence of a great King. God is the king of all kings. And he's been around forever, will be around forever. And he controls everyone and everything. And we have to behave at all times like we're in the presence of God. And that's what's needed if you want to make yourself into a sanctuary worthy of God dwelling within you. And of course, this is a lot of work, but this is our life mission. And the Mishkan is a, is the model that we must emulate. So, of course, we're hoping 
very soon, please God, to witness the actual rebuilding of the temple, the third temple. But even absent the temple, it's incumbent upon us to create a mini sanctuary within ourselves, to improve ourselves, to perfect ourselves, to cleanse ourselves, to refine ourselves, to make ourselves worthy of being a sanctuary for God. The Talmud tells us that someone who is arrogant, who is haughty, who has hubris, God says, so to speak, I cannot live with that person. He thinks he rules the world. Well, there's just an incompatibility. So if someone's arrogant, that's that that makes them not a candidate to be a sanctuary for God. If someone displays a lack of faith, that's saying, uh, where's God? God's not here. Okay, well, God's not here. You have created a self-fulfilling prophecy. God's not here. You're not a sanctuary for God. If someone doesn't rely on God, well, that's not a place where God wants to dwell. It's not a place that's fitting for it. Someone must have resplendent, refined character. Someone must adopt the agenda of God. Make his will your will. Someone must not allow anything that runs counter to God to have any foothold within them if they want to be a sanctuary for God. So this is obviously a description of a vast, all-encompassing work. This is what Hashem wants. Make within yourself a residence where God can dwell. It's hard. It's all-encompassing, but it is of the highest priority. And everything good that we do is part of this process of making ourselves into a sanctuary. But here's the point. You cannot violate the Shabbos to do it. This is the highest priority, but that does not mean that you should trample or shove aside anyone else or anything else to do that. Building the tabernacle, building the sanctuary cannot override Shabbos. We have to sometimes stop the sacrosanct work of building a tabernacle for Shabbos. We cannot run roughshod over everyone and everything to accomplish this. When we build the sanctuary, we can't just barrel over anyone else. Our mission cannot be predicated upon trampling over others. Yes, we need to build a sanctuary, but there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. We cannot move fast and break things in pursuit of this goal. So we spoke about this many times. Moshe is told to go save the Jewish people. It's the will of Hashem. And what does he say? Send Aaron. I don't want to make Aaron feel bad. And this decision is the decision that God criticizes him for. And God gets angry, so to speak, with Moshe. But why? God's only angry at Moshe for his refusal to listen to God only because Moshe misjudged Aaron's character. Aaron was truly happy, glad in his heart. And therefore Moshe had an incorrect assessment of Aaron's sentiments, and that's why God got angry at him. But if it were true that Aaron's feelings would have been hurt, then Moshe's decision to withhold from building his sanctuary, so to speak, that would have been correct and lauded. As a matter of principle, Moshe's calculation was accurate. Similarly, and again, we've talked about this in the past, Moshe, after he agrees to go save the Jewish people, he stops off by Jethro and gets permission to, to leave. Why? Because Jethro and Moshe had made a pact that, that Moshe would not leave without permission. But God told you to do it. You're building your tabernacle. You cannot override Shabbos. Whenever you are building your sanctuary, you must be very cognizant of the fact that the ends do not always justify the means. In our Parsha, we have the laver, the kior. That's where the Kohanim, they wash their hands, their feet before they enter into the Mishkan. And today we don't have a kior, but we still have this concept, our sages tell us. In the morning, you wake up, you wash your hands. Before you eat, you wash your hands. After you use the facilities, you wash your hands. And that's in some way resembling what was done in the Mishkan with the kior. So this is a great story. The great Rabbi Israel Salanter, he was once washing his hands, and that's the mitzvah, right? You wash your hands. 
But instead of taking copious amounts of water to really fulfill the mitzvah properly, he was like putting just a little bit of water to just, just discharge his responsibility in the most, in the most meager way. And someone said to him, Rabbi, this is a mitzvah. This is a mitzvah to wash your hands. You should take a huge cup of water and pour it all over your hands. And the rabbi responded, well, where does the water come from? There's an old woman here. She's the water carrier. Or there's an old man here. And they have to schlep the water. And they got to walk all the way down to the well and pick it up and pull it back here on their back. If I use more water, they'll have to schlep more water. So yes, it's, it's great to pour lots of water, but you're, you're trampling over someone else. You cannot build your sanctuary if you're going to override Shabbos. You cannot build your sanctuary and and demand that other people will go schlep water for you. I will tell you as an aside, I had a conversation with my friend David, and he just happened to mention the story. I said, David, you don't understand. This story is in my notes for this Parsha podcast. So that's like a, a wink from God. It made me very happy. We're here to build a sanctuary. And that's perhaps a reason why this this part of the Torah is emphasized and is is told at such length. And it's a nice lesson to remember that that's our job, to build a sanctuary. But we have to be very care- careful not to violate Shabbos, not to violate other things that would be a terrible way to build a sanctuary uh, by trampling over others and, and, and doing things that are not okay. That's segment number one. Segment number two talks about the actual building of the tabernacle. So everyone's there. Everyone's gathered. The whole nation. And Moshe outlines what they need to donate and what they need to build. And they begin. And it starts with fundraising. Everyone brings their gold and their precious precious materials. The princes bring the precious stones for the ephod and for the choshen. And in only two days, all the necessary Materials are assembled, and then they begin the actual construction, the vessels, the art, the manure, the table, the inner altar, the outer altar, the aforementioned laver, and all their accoutrements, and then the beams, and the bars, and the brackets, and the bases, and the covers, the goat hair one, the red goat skin one, and the tachash cover, the linen, the wool, the hooks, everything, everything done in perfect fulfillment of the plans. Precisely, following the immutable measurements, the exact measurements to a T. Moshe tells the nation about Betzal. Betzal is the grand foreman, together with Ahaliyav, and all the artisans and craftsmen, and craftswomen, craftspeople. The men, the women, they, they work on the Mishkan and all the associated things. And next week we have the description of the vestments of the high priest. And at the end of Exodus, I don't want to spoil it for you, but at the end of Exodus, the Mishnah is complete and is inaugurated. And of course, we hear more about that in Leviticus. The commentaries investigate a stunning element of the construction of the tabernacle and its vessels. So who built it? So we talked about Betzalel, he's the foreman. And his primary lieutenant is Ahaliyav. And then there's a cohort of volunteer artisans and craftsmen. Who were these people? What were their credentials, their qualifications for these roles? What training did they undergo? How did they know how to do all this intricate and delicate work? I have a friend whose father is a, is a glass blower from Italy. And he creates these incredible ornate glass items using very ancient methods. And these are family traditions that have been in the family for generations and centuries. And they pass it on to the kids and they apprentice and they work at it for years before they become experts. To be a craftsman, an artisan, to do world class work, you need a lot of training. Whenever you see people that have, you know, tremendous ability in one field, you always understand that they didn't 
just fall off the boat and do it. They were trained. They started off as being novices and they became experts. Someone does like an ice carving. You've seen that. An ice carving. And they just chip away at the ice and it becomes some sort of image. That's a steal. You had to work a long time to do that. To paint. Every profession, every occupation needs some degree of training. And the more intricate the work, the more highly specialized and skilled you must be. If you want to work on Rolex watches, you got to undergo a two-year intensive training. You know, two of my friends, my friends Bill and Bruce, trained gemologists. You have to go to school for that. You want to do surgery. You got to do your pre-med, your med, your internship, your residency, your fellowship. These people are doing incredibly intricate work. Where is the training? A few months ago, they were slaves in Egypt. They leave Egypt on Pesach and Passover. A half a year later, it's, it's Sukkot, Sukkot, exactly six months. And that's when they start working. So, these people have a maximum of a half a year since they were in Egypt. Did they go to gemologist school? How do they know how to do this? That's a question that the commentaries investigate. And the Ramban speaks about this in a few different places. And he says some unbelievable things. And we spoke about this in the past, but today I want to suggest something a bit different. So in last week's parsha, we are introduced to Betzalel. God tells Moshe, Re'eh, see, behold, I have called my name Betzalel, ben Uri, ben Chur, Lamate Yehuda, Betzalel, son of Uri, son of Chur, to the tribe of Judah. And the Ramban, he notes that this is an unusual way to introduce someone. He could just say, well, there's a man named Betzalel. Why does it say, Re'eh, behold, see, witness this incredible thing to marvel at? So the Rabban explains that this is really something to behold. Because the Jewish people in Egypt, they were forced to work back-breaking labor of what sort? Chomer, Levanim, mortar, and bricks. Very coarse work. They didn't learn how to deal with metals, with fine precious metals, with silver, with gold, with uh, hewing of stones. Not only didn't they work in it, they never saw it. It's something really wondrous. It's amazing. It's an astonishing thing to behold that you'll find someone like Betzalel. Betzalel, we know he was 13 at the time. And he was a Chacham Gadol. He was a very wise man who knew all the skills, all the different types of work that was needed for all these different types of materials. He knew it all. And even if someone was trained, you never see someone who knows all. You can see someone be very very specialized in one particular area. But you don't see someone who is an expert, a world-class expert in so many different disciplines and domains. So it's a, it's a, it's a double miracle. They weren't trained. In fact, the work that they were doing was with bricks and with mortar. And you have someone who's an expert in all these very fine, intricate skills, and not just one, in all of them. So despite the fact that the Jewish people were enslaved, working with hard labor, there's Betzala, who in the most delicate and fine areas of work, the gem cutting and the intricate embroidery, etc., he has expertise. Moreover, so that's something to marvel. That, that, that's how the Ramban explains the verse that says, Re'e, see, behold, look, look at this thing which is so wondrous. And then he adds that Basal was an expert in not just the, the craftsmanship, but also in the secrets. Because each thing, each measurement, each material, each vessel is replete with all sorts of secrets all sorts of mystical ideas. And Basala knew the physical labor, but also the spiritual secrets behind each and every part of the Mishkan. 
So this is something wondrous, something to marvel at, something to behold, something that if you do not see it yourself, you wouldn't believe it. How can it be that a slave will be such a renaissance man, a polymath, an expert in so many different domains? But Salal, he's a phenom, and that needs to be marveled at. And then Rabban offers a second interpretation. He cites the Midrash. Midrash says that there's a book, the Chronicles of Adam, and in that book it says the names of all the big important people in all of history, and there's an entry called Building the Tabernacle, and next to it it says Betzalel, and God showed Moshe this book. Ray, see, look at the book. Betzalel's the right person for the job. So, Betzalel is a complete outlier. He's a wunderkind. He has supernatural abilities. And he was designated since the times of Adam to be the one to build the tabernacle. Ray, behold, look at this incredible, wondrous thing. But what about all the other people who helped Betzalel? In our parasha, we read that it's not just Betzalel and Ahaliyah. It's a whole cohort, a whole list. Not a list. We don't know the list. But it's a whole group of people who answered the call and joined in the effort. How did they know how to do it? So the Rabban has another comment. And if you read it very carefully, he points out that there's a, it seems like there's a subtle difference between Betzalel and all the other artisans and craftsmen. The verse tells us, chapter 35, verse 21, that all men whose heart inspired them and all those whose spirit was generous, they, they came and they joined the efforts and they contributed towards the tabernacle. And the Ramban, in his commentary, he separates between the, the men whose heart were elevated, heart were inspired, and those whose spirit was dedicated. Again, the Torah doesn't use words without precision, of course. The verse describes the people that, that came People whose heart were inspired and people whose spirit was generous. So the Rabban tells us that these two different types of volunteers, they volunteered in two different areas. There were people who made donations of, of, of gold, of silver, of copper, etc., of all these types of wool, of the linen, of the goat hair, of the wood, and so on. And those are the people whose, whose spirit was generous. But the people regarding whom it says their heart was elevated, that was a reference not to those who who gave material donations. It is a reference to those who worked with Betzalel. The builders, the artisans, the craftsmen who joined Betzalel in constructing the Mishkan and all its vessels, they were not ones who were who, who, whose spirit was generous. No, they, they had an elevated heart. Their heart ascended. Now, what does that mean? So listen to this, Ramban. These people, their heart was ascended to approach the work because they had no one who taught them. They were never trained. They received no apprenticeship. But they discovered in their nature, that they knew how to do it. Their heart was ascended. They came to Moshe and they said, I will do whatever you need me to do. Whatever my master says, I will do. This Ramban telling us something unbelievable. How did the artisans know how to do all the fine, intricate work, the metal and the wood and the fine embroidery? How did Batsal's army of helpers, of lieutenants, how do they know how to do all this work? Their hearts ascended. That's what the verse says. Their heart was elevated. This ability to do work when you're not trained and you don't have the qualifications, the classic credentials. They didn't learn the trade in a typical way as a journeyman as someone who watches YouTube videos, as someone who went to school, well, there's a whole different way that they studied. Their heart ascended. 
Now, if you notice, both Betzalel and the other artisans, they both didn't have what we would call classical training. Both were recently released slaves who were unaccustomed to the fine, to the intricate work of the tabernacle vessels. But the verse says that Betzalel, that's something to marvel at. Ray, see, behold, he's the outlier. He's someone that got endowed with supernatural, preternatural abilities. The Raman tells us that the volunteers who answered Moshe's call and volunteered to build the Mishkan, they weren't necessarily endowed with some sort of supernatural ability from God. They weren't in the book of Adam that it was preordained that they're going to do this. They didn't have any qualification, any skill, any training, anything special about them aside from the fact that their heart ascended and they discovered natural abilities. But Salah, he's a complete anomaly. He's able to do all the work. And it's so rare, maybe it's impossible to find someone with world-class abilities in so many areas. Yes, you can find in one area, but to find in so many areas, that's supernatural. That's something to admire and to marvel at. Re'eh, behold! God called Betzal ben Ur-Mahur for the tribe of Judah by name. These volunteers, there was nothing special about them. And they were regular, ordinary Joes. But they made a decision. And their decision was to elevate their heart. And to do something that they really had no business knowing how to do. So there's a difference here. Both Betzal and the volunteers, they never wove, they never spun, they never hewed, they never etched, carved, or fashioned. They didn't have the the typical training. None of them were impre- apprentices by some master. But there's a difference. Betzal, he's a marvel. Since the times of Adam, he was designated for this role. And everyone else, they, they volunteered. And they were able to do it if their heart ascended, if their heart was inspired, if their heart was elevated. And if they did that, they would discover that they knew how to do the work without any training. If you map this out, it seems like there are three ways to do this type of work. This type of world-class excellence in this form of work. There's one way where what we would call the classic path. You, you get your training and you become an apprentice and you're a journeyman and you put in your hours and you put in your years and you learn. And hopefully if you have some sort of knack for it and you pick it up, you'll be able to do it. That's path number one. And path number two, that's the Betzal path. You're in the book of Adam. You were designated to have all these skills. And nothing else matters. You're just endowed by God in a way that no one else else ever was. And you know everything. You know all the secrets. You know how heaven and earth were created, the Talmud tells us. And he's 13. Doesn't matter. (laughs) Doesn't matter. You were just given this gift from Hashem. Something to marvel at. And then there's a third path. We call it the path of the volunteer. That is open to all. It's another way to bypass the classical training, the classical process of being an apprentice of a journeyman and doing it the right way or the, the slow way. And it's for people that are not Betzal. And that's the process of, or the path of the ascension of the heart. Now, these volunteers, they appear many times in our Parsha, chapter 35, verse 10. The nation's told, any person whose heart is intelligent, chacham leif, what, what does that mean? I don't know. We'll talk more about that. Chapter 35, 21, 36, 1, and so on. Many times it's mentioned that there were people who weren't trained and who are not but solid, they're not in the book of Adam, and they knew how to do this highly specialized, this highly intricate work for the tabernacle. And how? What's their secret? Their heart was inspired. Their heart was wise. Their heart ascended. 
This is path number three, the path of the volunteer. There's a way to get the transcendental greatness if you just understand the secret of the heart ascending. Now, what does that mean? This is a question we've talked about in the past. And in the past, we suggested that it means to just believe in yourself and to take initiative and to go for an outlandish objective and to undertake outrageous missions. And that will unlock hitherto unknown powers. And maybe that's the ascension of the heart. But today I want to share a different perspective based upon a concept that I heard from my grandfather of blessed memory. What does it mean to be wise-hearted or to have an ascension of the heart? The, the organ involved in this path, the path of the volunteer, is the heart. Now, what, what does it mean? So there's a midrash that differentiates between doing something half-heartedly versus wholeheartedly. And to do it with a happy heart or a sad heart. It tells us that when Joseph was thrown into the pit by his brothers, Reuven intervened. And he, he saved Joseph. But the Midrash says he did it half-heartedly. And the reason why he did it half-heartedly it's because he did not realize that the Torah would talk about it. He didn't realize this would be featured in, in the Torah forever. And had he known that this would be in the Torah forever, he would have taken Joseph and put him on his shoulders and say, you want to take Joseph? You got to shoot me first. You got to kill me first. And he would have marched him back to his father, to Jacob. But because Reuven did it half-heartedly, he didn't realize that his entire legacy and his, his permanent future hinges upon it. He did it half-heartedly and he didn't save Joseph the entire way. When you realize that there is something that everything depends upon, that you were created to do, something that will determine your standing and your status forever, something that will, so to speak, etch your name into eternity. And you say, I'm going to do that? When you realize that, that, that the Torah will speak about you? And you act upon that knowledge? That is the definition of a full heart, of a happy heart. This is a deep idea. If a person realizes that what you're about to do that's your eternity, that's your destiny, that's your legacy, that's why you were created that's an entirely different universe of of an idea, of an act than something that you're just doing because you're just doing it. This attitude will clear any path from any resistance. We have people they're being told here God wants a physical home to dwell in. Just think about that. God wants to leave the heaven, so to speak, and to come with us in our journeys. It's an outrageous proposal. But that's what God wants. And he's asking all these people who wants to help. Now, you know nothing about embroidery. You've never lifted a needle in your life. You know nothing. Your training is only in bricks and mortar. That's it. But you know that God is asking for volunteers. And you realize you have a recognition that this is an opportunity for eternity. This is something that really, this is what we're created to do. When you have that realization, your heart ascends. It goes from half-hearted to full-hearted. And when you do something full-heartedly, nothing stands in your way. A wholesome, happy heart, a full heart, a wise heart, an elevated heart. That is an example of someone doing something that will reverberate for all eternity. And they'll discover 
abilities that they always had maybe, but abilities that were reserved for these types of circumstances. Just as an analogy, we've, we're all familiar with the phenomenon of, God forbid, someone you know, being trapped underneath something very heavy or something like that, a car, or an airplane, a, a boulder. And then this small lady comes and pushes the, the car, all 2,500 pounds of it, out of the way. There's a phenomenon like that. That's this idea. We have reservoirs of ability within ourselves that only in case of emergency do we break the glass. Only in, ca- in the case where everything matters upon this, only then are those abilities mobilized. Only then are those abilities brought to the surface. They're always within you. It's, it's, it's natural. You don't need training. But it'll only come to the surface when it's something you're doing wholeheartedly, with a full heart, with a happy heart, with a wise heart, with an elevated and inspired heart. In the parish, I talked about these volunteers. Whoever wanted to do it could do it. What if someone doesn't know how to do it? Well, none of them know how to do it. So how do they do it? They did it because they, they were naturals. That's what the Rabban tells us. What does that mean? They weren't at. How could it be that whoever wanted to be as a natural? If your life depends upon it. If you realize that this is why you exist. If this is the only thing that matters. Then you will discover that you are a natural. You think about uh, babies. They're born utterly ignorant. They don't know anything, can't even talk or babble. They lack knowledge in the most perfect way. They're perfectly ignorant. So how come babies don't need to be trained to breathe? Why don't they need to train to suckle? Why don't they have to go to school to, to train, to be an apprentice, to learn, to learn how to digest? That's a very complex activity. But we're all naturals. I'm not speaking for you. Most of us are naturals. There's a principle. Anything you need for your life, anything your life depends upon, you have the ability to do it. And you have it naturally. The things that we realize that we need for our life, that is the process of elevating the heart. They become like digestion. Someone who never held a needle can become a master craftsman via this process. We know that our objective in life may be different than someone else's. Yeah, we all have the Torah, we all have the Sitchan and Thirteen Mitzvos. But each one of us has a special mission. We all have, a, we're all different because we all have a different soul and the different soul manifests itself with a different mission. And we have different qualities, different flaws and different shortcomings because we have an individualized mission that's unique to us. We could say that this is Batsala. Batsala is someone who his mission in life was to build a tabernacle. That was his mission. In the, in the book of Adam, the chronicles of Adam had said Batsala's name. It did not say the name of anyone else. All of the people, it, it wasn't their mission. It wasn't something that they had a particular aptitude towards. They had some sort of natural, I, mean, oh, I always wanted to be a weaver. I always wanted to hew the gold. I always wanted to fashion these very intricate designs. No, they, they weren't necessarily predisposed to that. There's a third path here. And that's the path of someone saying, going over to Moshe and say, what do you need? What does Hashem need? What, is he, what do you want? Whatever that is, I'm in. I'm loyal to the cause. And if the cause means you have to learn how to sow, I'll do it. My life depends upon it. That's the third process. And that's the third path. The path of the volunteer. And this is truthfully the, the path of the Levites. I think this is an idea we've talked about in the past. All the other tribes are given a particular 
parcel of land in the land of Israel, but not Levi. Levi is in cities scattered throughout the land. And the reason is because every tribe is given in a, a portion of the land, of the biblical land, that is particularly suited for their unique aptitude and their unique mission of the collective mission of the Jewish people. And therefore their position to fulfill their their life objective. Levi is someone who is loyal to God. Whatever God needs, I'm going to do. I'm going to discover the ability to do whatever needs to get done in any given circumstance. Historically, the tribe of Yisachar, they were the scholars. But at the end of the Torah, Moshe assigns the scholarship to both Yisachar and to Levi. And the answer is, is that Levi and Yisachar are both scholars, but they got to the, they got to it with different paths. Yisachar, he's like, he's like Pesalo. He was endowed with a special ability and talent and capabilities to be a scholar. And that's why he's a scholar. Levi's not necessarily predisposed towards that that quality or that ability to him, whatever needs to get done, whatever Hashem needs, that's what I'm going to do. And that's they don't have a land because their mission is to do whatever needs to get done. Whenever there's a call, they will answer. We, in life, we all have a vexing dilemma. We don't know what our mission is. We don't know what our particular skills are. Well, what does it say in the Chronicle of Adam about us. We don't know. In antiquity, we have prophets. The prophets would reveal to us what our mission is. Here we discover that there's a third mission. It's the Levi mission. It's the mission of these artisans. It's the mission of the volunteers. And that is whatever the nation needs, whatever God needs, whatever there's a calling, and I want to do it because I want to fulfill the will of Hashem, and that matters to me so much. It's, it's my, my heart is telling me, do this. This is what needs to get done. That's a way to uncover reservoirs of ability that are only discoverable at that time. We're not necessarily born with any particular talent to sow or to do anything. But if you realize in a circumstance, in a, in a scenario where there's a need, Moshe says, I need volunteers. And you don't have the particular aptitude, or maybe you do, maybe you don't. There is a path to say, there's a need, and I could play a role that will reverberate forever. And this is a circumstance that gives me the possibility to have some sort of eternal accomplishment. Your heart gets mobilized, and abilities that were within you are now unlocked for you to do. That's the process, that's the idea of this process of ascension of the heart. I think it's a very powerful idea, a very, very deep idea. It's the path of the Levite, it's the path of the volunteer. But Saul, he's something to marvel at. He had natural, supernatural ability, but that came to him naturally. And he was designated to do, to do that. We have other people who are not necessarily designated for anything in relation to the Mishkan. And they said, I want to do it. And they were inspired. And their heart ascended. And they understood that this is what they need to do. And they discovered this ability that was there, but can only be accessed with that level of commitment. And this, I think, this concept can be used in many different ways in our lives. The Levites... That's what they stand for as as a tribe. But anyone who wants to say, I want to do whatever Hashem needs, whatever needs to get done, that's my responsibility. Wherever there's a need for the Almighty in the world, I will do it. No matter what it takes, no matter whether or not I have a, a, a natural predisposition towards that. They become like a Levite. They become like these volunteers. Their heart is ascended and they will be able to do it. I appreciate your time. I thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did, or even 10% as much as I did. 
My email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. I'm really looking forward to next week. Please, God, we're going to have our fundraiser. Of course, we're going to have a partial podcast. Please, God, next week as well. But uh, we hope that everyone could contribute towards this annual fundraiser. You give a gift. You give what you can. You support the great work of Torch, the great work of the Partnership Podcast, and all the other incredible programs coming out of the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. Have a wonderful day. Have a terrific rest of your week. A sensational, uplifting, elevating, elevating, elevation of the heart. Shabbos are coming. And please, God, we'll talk again next week. And we'll also have the fundraiser, please God, next week. And again, the email address is rabbiwobijim.com. Let me know if you want an invitation to the insider-only podcast. I'll send it to you, rabbiwobijim.com.